The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, presents Edward Arnold in a dramatization of the Saturday Evening Post story, Fat Girl. Hey, you on the top, you call that a ship? That ain't no ship. That's a floating wet nurse. She's the fat girl. That's what she is. The fat girl. (laughs) Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. This evening, it is our privilege to announce that for the service it has given in dramatizing events and personalities which most effectively epitomized the spirit of a democratic people, the Cavalcade of America has won first award in the field of radio drama in the annual poll conducted by the Women's National Radio Committee among club women of the nation. Tonight with Edward Arnold as Captain John B. Phillips, we bring you the story of one of the ugly ducklings of our Navy. Mr. Arnold appears through the courtesy of MGM, in whose production the youngest profession he is now starring. Our radio play, adapted from a Saturday Evening Post article by Charles Rawlings and Isabel Layton, was written by Paul Peters. Later on the program, you will hear from Miss Layton and from Captain Phillips of the USS Neosho, whose historic escape inspired our program tonight. The Cavalcade of America presents Fat Girl, with Edward Arnold as Captain John B. Phillips of the USS Neosho and the narrator of our program. <laughs> Her name was the USS Neosho, an auxiliary oil tanker attached to the Pacific Fleet. Do you hear that? That's the voice of a horn. That's our bell. And that's her cry of alarm when attacked. That's the throb of her engines deep within her stern. The great steel heart that propels her plunging but unafraid through a wilderness of ocean. Between her engines and her bridge she carried in a vast uninhabitable reservoir... 150 barrels of gasoline and oil. Her duty was to suckle the haughty warships, but the men on the proud fighting ships would jeer at her ungainly shape, and when she heaved alongside their slim, sleek decks, they would call out in contempt, Here comes the fat girl! December the 6th, daybreak. The fat girl slid into dock at Hickam Field, Pearl Harbor. She pumped 500,000 gallons of octane gas into Hickam's tanks. Late evening, she shifted across the bay to Fort Island. All night, her pumps pounded, sluicing another half million gallons into the Navy's shore tanks. December the 7th, 7.55 a.m., Captain John S. Phillips and his executive officer, Lieutenant Commander Francis J. Firth, strolled on deck. Yeah, it's good out here, Captain. Uh-huh. Cool, but the sun's nice. Yeah. Huh. One of those Navy flyers must have gotten up early today. Yeah. Say, has he gone crazy, dive bombing over a live target before 8 o'clock on Sunday morning? Did he drop in something? Hey, what's those markings on his wings? Say, that isn't one of our planes. That's the sun. Red sun. Japs, they're bombing our battleships. Quick, Frankie, on the bridge. Sound General Quarters. General Quarters, battle stations. Tell the gunnery officer to man all anti aircraft batteries. Mr. Brown. Miss Brown. Mrs. Brown. Japanese planes bombing our ships. Man all anti aircraft batteries. Japanese. Get the engine yes, and tell Lieutenant Verbrugge to stand by to answer bells. We've got to get out of here fast. Cut the mooring lines to the rail with axes. Mr. Verbrugge. Miss Verbrugge. Mrs. Verbrugge. Stand by to answer bells. We're backing out of here. They're taking access to mooring lines. Very well, sir. What was that? The Arizona. At the end of the jetty. Blown up and burst into flames. Tell the rookie to get those engines going. Eight fifteen. The fat girl backing away slowly, slowly past the sunken Oklahoma, past the wounded Tennessee and West Virginia, past stricken Arizona. Racks of bombs straddled the big gray oiler as she slid through Pearl Harbor's watery inferno. But her skipper brought her safely to Mary Point without losing a man or a chip of paint. He wears a Navy cross today to help him remember it. Next night, he was walking on deck. And he was talking to his officers. Well, gentlemen, we're the only fleet oiler left in the mid-Pacific. 
For the next few months, we'll have to fuel all the ships. The Lexington, the Sims, the Yorktown, all of them. That means sailing day and night through drained dangerous waters and sailing alone. The Navy can spare no escort for an oiler. It's going to be tough going, gentlemen. But I know that the fat girl can count on you, on every last one of you. A few months passed. It is May the 7th. The fat girl has had a rendezvous with a big task force 450 miles off the coast of Australia. At daybreak, when she reached the appointed spot, the skipper and his executive officer were scanning the horizon. Oh, you can see an awful lot of the Pacific in this early morning light, Captain. Yeah, no task force in sight. Oh. Something to do with that uh, night report from the commander-in-chief, perhaps, huh? Uh-huh. I'll tell you, Frankie, but keep it under your hat. There's a strong Japanese naval force nearby. Right now, there's probably a big battle starting in the core of the sea. Guns flying on the starboard bow. The close ones, huh? Frankie, get the crew to battle stations. Man the anti-aircraft batteries. Yes, sir. Miss Brown, Miss Brown, man all anti-aircraft stations. Oh, there he is, up in that cloud. Single engine bomber, headed north. Ah, he'll be back. There's 50 more, I suspect. Mr. Verbrugge. Mr. Verbrugge. Yes, sir. This is Verbrugge. I'm going to bring the ship around and head of northwest. Give the engines all we've got. Ten AM. The first of the Japanese bombers went over, flying high in formation. They scorned the Neosho's puny gunny fire. Half a mile too short. 10.35, 12 more planes. They dropped three bombs, but the fat girl dodged. 12 noon, on deck the gun crews ate their midday stew from canisters. Hey, kid, key your eyes on that southern horizon. Pop, I got them glued there. Seems to me I see something, like a string of flies up against the sky. Man all and aircraft stations. Man all and aircraft stations. Yippee! Here they come. Bring that gun around, kid. Come right at you, Pop. And bring that magazine of 20s over. All right, you nips. Come on in and see the fat girl. See her quiver while she fights. Come on, come all. They're going into attack formation. Lead plane's peeling off. Boy, can that bird travel? Shut up and get a beat on him. Hey, kid. Kid, are you hurt? Look at him. Don't look at him. He's... Don't look. He was joking only a minute ago. Get back to your gun. There's another one coming in. Go on now. Get back. He's burning. He's on fire. Look, kid. I got him for you. He's burning, kid. Burning like a torch. Look out. He's still coming. He's got his back on deck. Now you fool. Drop down. Two more bombs gave the fat girl a mortal wound. One whistled through the fire room hatch exploding among the boilers and the steam lines. A second mangled the fat girl amidship. A power gone, she stopped in a cloud of steam and lurched to the starboard with a 30-degree list. 1218, seeing a shattered burning hulk below, the Japs flew off. A sailor plunging through smoke and flames stumbled over a body. Commander Firth! Commander Firth, is, is that you? Uh, uh... Are you hurt, sir? No. I guess I just knocked out by the concussion. Here, let me help you up, sir. Better now? Yeah, great, I know. Now, you go to the captain. You tell him we're sinking. Ask him what he intends to do about abandoning ship. Oh, he's already answered that, sir. The captain sent me to tell you. Hang on a while. Below the fire room were the fat girl's engines. Harold Bratt, machinist mate, first class, picked himself off the floor and swung his flashlight up the steel ladder that was the only exit into a volcano of roaring live stream. Then he turned and faced his four dead companions. You hear that steam? That last bomb got the boilers. How are we going to get out of here, Chin? We can't get out now, boy. We're cut off. We'll have to wait a while. Wait? What for? We got no more engines. We can't go, I tell you. We'll never get through that fire room alive. Where's that water coming from? Well, drown. Drown in this rotten black hole. Let me out of here. Joe, Joe, get away from that ladder. You two, Fred, come on, come on, get back. Now, listen to me, both of you. The chief water tender's up there. You know Oscar Peterson. He'll turn those steam bows off even if it kills them. 
You can count on Pete. In a few minutes, we'll be drowned. Sound like rats in a trap. I'm going up now. I'm going with you. Get out of my way, Chief. Now, wait a minute. I'm warning you. Get out of my way. Come on. Chief. Chief, you hurt, Chief. Where are you? Oh, I'm all right. Where's the flashlight? Uh, I took it with him, Chief. Oh, those saps. Those poor saps. Why didn't they obey orders? That steam will kill him. There's water up around my feet now, Chief. All right, all right. We'll wait a while. I can't stand it. Shut up. We'll wait a while. Oh, God help him. I feel water up to my knees. Listen. Listen. Do you hear that? What? The steam stopped. Peterson's done it. He shut off the valves. I knew he would. I knew it. Yeah, he did. Find some rags. There's a pile of them on the bulkhead shelves. Well? I got them. Here, come here. Let me have some. Now, cover up your hands and faces. Quick, now. Now, Riddle. Huh? Just a minute, Chief. You set now? I'm going up. Paul, you follow close to me. Don, you follow Paul. Steady now, fellas. Steady. Here's the escape hatch. Careful now. Yeah, sure, thick up here. Ah, Chief. What is it? What is it? I just stepped on. See if you can find my flashlight. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Here it is. I got the flashlight, Chief. Oh, poor Joe. There's Fred in the corner. All right, all right. Get him out of here. You two go on ahead. I'll light your way. Ain't you coming, Chief? Don't worry about me. I'm going back to look for Peterson. He found Peterson. And when he brought him into the blessed open air, he knew the water tender had sacrificed his life that others might live. Two days later, Peterson died. Mercifully, the ship's supply of morphine lasted just two days. 6 p.m., on the bridge, Captain Phillips scanned the fat girl with bitterness in his heart. A deck smoldered like a volcanic reef. A starboard rail rolled underwater. A foredeck was awash. The gunnery officer, Tom Brown, joined him. Chief radio officer says he's sending opposition every five minutes. Uh, no answer? No answer. Well, tell him to stop a while. What should we do with the wounded, sir? How many are there? 26. And lifeboats? Three, sir. <laughs> the rest were shelled or burned. Of course, there's the big motor sailor, but she's jammed in her chocks on the high side. There's no power for her winches. It'll take a solid day's work to get her overside. Um, what do you think, Captain? Will the fat girl last that long? I don't know. She's dying, Brownie. She's dying under my feet. Yes. Hadn't we better bury our dead and run down our ensign, sir? We could throw together some rafts for the rest of us. No, no, no. No, Brownie, if she must go down, let her go with colors flying. <laughs> She'll make a good coffin, Brownie. Yes, sir. Get those lifeboats alongside and load the wounded in them. Put on a skeleton crew for the watch and a good hand for the tillers and a man or two for bailing. Have them lay, lay off about 100 yards. Keep us inside all night. No flashlights, no signals. And the rest of us, sir? The rest of us will stand by. A anything I can do, Cap? Frankie, is that you? Sorry, Captain. I, I was burned a little. Burned a little? Well, can you see out of those eyes? Enough to get around, sir. Oh, come on, Brownie. Get him off his feet. Put him in one of those lifeboats. Oh, but, Captain, you, all you right, can't... All right, Frankie. You can take charge of a batch of wounded. Will that make you feel better? Very well, thank you. Never mind saluting me. <laughs> better get that arm bandaged. Thank you, sir. The quartermaster says the list has improved, sir. She's moved up to 25 degrees from 27 to 25, sir. She's moved? Up to 25 degrees, you say? Uh, she's trying to help herself, sir. Oh, good old fat girl. Good old fat girl. Still fighting for us, aren't you? Still want to carry on for us, don't you? Well, by all that's holy, we'll fight for you. You are listening to Fat Girl on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. Our play tonight stars Edward Arnold as Captain John S. Phillips of the USS Neosho, an auxiliary oil tanker that miraculously escaped Pearl Harbor and for weeks and months gallantly carried on with her duties. Then one day, Jap bombers spotted her. As our play continues, they have left, and the fat girl is mortally wounded. Sundown, May 8th. The fat girl struggling valiantly, but settling inch by inch. Now her crew paused in their labors for a somber duty. 
We're ready to bury the dead, Captain Phillips. Yeah. Well, did you find the Bible, Brownie? No, sir. It was last seen in the mess hall, and Byers cleaned that out. <laughs> well, I suppose I'd better make up a prayer, huh? I suppose so, sir. How about that little Jap? Little Jap? Yeah, the one that crashed on deck. Oh, him. He's still up there, sir. Leaning against number four gun base. Boys go up and take a look at him once in a while. Mr. So Sorry, they call him. Sort of a mascot, he You don't want him buried. No, no, not with our dead. But don't let anybody disturb him. Certainly not, sir. Oh, uh, Brownie, uh, will you do me a favor? Favor? Yeah. Make up a prayer and say it for them, will you? Golly, Skipper, I, I'm not very good at... I wish you'd say that. Me? <laughs> All right, Brownie. I'll do the best I can. Dear God, these men were our friends and comrades. They were good men, God. They served their country faithfully. And when they died, they died a fine death, defending their ship. Now we're going to lay them to rest in the sea. Give them peace, O oh Lord. And have mercy on the dear ones at home. Amen. May the 9th, ship drifting helpless in a heavy swell. List 24 degrees. Upper deck and starboard side awash. The fat girl was sinking. Her hours were numbered. Well, well, Brownie, Commander, the motor sailor. She launched yet? Any minute now, sir. Well, tell him to hurry. Tell him to hurry. Very well, sir. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't have to tell him that. I don't think so. As soon as she's in the water loaded with stores, you and I will board her with the wounded. The others will man the lifeboats with square sails. We'll be the only boat with power. We'll use the motor to round them up every morning and keep the boats together. There's to be no separating. I understand, sir. We'll run with the wind for Willis Islets, and then on to Trinity Opening in the Great Barrier Reef. Yes, sir. How about guns, sir? Sidearms on officers. Stack a two of rifles in the big boat. No guns in the little ones. It's going to be a long, hard run, Brownie. We want no crazy men with guns. Right you are, sir. Yes, and our big trouble will be the sun. From zenith on, we'll be looking straight into it. It's going to be hell. A trip through purgatory for our burned men, Browning. Funny we don't hear anything on the air. Oh, forget that. I saw gun flashes last night toward the Coral Sea. We're on the fringes of a big battle, Browning. Maybe nobody can spare time for us. Maybe they have nothing to send. Say, hey, they're cheering. You know what that means? Thank God. They've launched the motor center. And thank the fat girl, too. Two thirty p.m. Crane sighted to starboard. Crane sighted to starboard. First sound general quarters. Siren side with the dynamo, sir. The bell then. Ring the ship's bell. Man all at our aircraft station. Man all at our aircraft station. Here, give me those glasses. You can't see with those swollen eyes. One minute, sir. Red on the, on the underside of the wings, sir. Red. Yeah. A red, a red what? But that's no nip, sir. That's us. That's us. Light bomber, Royal Australian Air Force. He's circling, sir. Circling overhead. Oh, there goes his searchlight signal. A R E. Signalman. Signalman. Yes, sir. Why? Oh, you. Stand by the emergency battery signal lamp. I N T R O U. He says, Are you in trouble, sir? Signalman. Yes, sir. Answer yes. I'll give him our latitude and longitude. What's the matter? No answer? Yes, sir. That's all. He just searched. Signalman. Again, latitude and longitude. He's going away, sir. No acknowledgement. Says, going away. Well, back to work. We'll just act as if nothing has happened. Maybe nothing has. May the 10th, food ration. Officers and men assigned to stations in the four lifeboats. After end of the fat girl dangerously low in the water. Final preparations to abandon ship. 
1 p.m. Yep, silence is now out. It's a destroyer, sir. What do you make of her? What do you make her out to be, Brownie? She might be either, sir. I... Oh, no, wait a minute. It's... Yes, that's our ensign. That's one of our 400, Skipper. Signalman, signalman. Yes, Captain. Believe Neo show in immediate danger. Capsizing. What instructions? She's answering, sir. N O I N S T R. No instructions. Signalman. Yes, sir. Tell him lay off 100 yards. We'll come to you. Brownie, every man has, uh, has five minutes to get his belongings. Wounded first in the motor sailor. Tow one of the whalers. Now hurry. We can't hold that destroyer in infested waters. <laughs> One forty p.m., the commander of the Neosho left his ship, the last man off, having transferred safely to the USS Henley his officers and enlisted personnel. At 2.22 p.m., he stood on the bridge of the destroyer, watching a gun crew pump shells into the death-racked fat girl. Oh, hit her astern, I tell you. Hit her astern. We're trying, Captain. Don't torture her like that. Get her down. Yes, Captain, we'll get her down. Just get her under. Get her under for me. And so the gallant fat girl went bow down. Thank you, Edward Arnold. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, Mr. Arnold will return to the microphone to present our guests, Miss Isabel Layton, co-author of Fat Girl, and Captain John S. Phillips, who commanded the USS Neosho. Meanwhile, we have a story of chemistry that will be of interest to everyone. Here is Gain Whitman to tell it. No matter how many machines America has producing for war, the most wonderful and important machine of all is still the human hand that guides and controls them. For a number of years, DuPont has made a protective hand cream sold under the trademark Protec. Painters and mechanics used it to keep paint and grime from sticking to their hands. Factory workers used it to protect their hands from grime and solvents that might cause skin irritation. When the war started, DuPont began to get a flood of new orders for Protec from many industrial centers. Behind those orders lies an interesting story. Skin ailments in industry, even in peacetime, cost the nation something like $7 million a year in lost man hours. In wartime, there is vastly more production. There are many more workers, and many of those workers are women, or men recruited from white-collar jobs. These men and women taking factory jobs for the first time often have soft hands, hands sensitive to cutting oils, solvents, and other irritating compounds used in many industrial operations. In some plants, workers can't wear gloves because gloves are liable to get caught in the machines or interfere with delicate operations. So more and more war workers are now using Protec, as an invisible work glove to protect the hands and arms against grime and other skin irritants. Protec is a soft, greaseless cream that looks and smells like vanishing cream. But unlike a vanishing cream, it forms a dry, transparent film, which is not dissolved by oil paints, grime, or straight-cutting oils, but will dissolve in water. If a worker applies Protec to his hands and arms before starting work, it helps to protect his skin against irritants. All he has to do after work is wash his hands in running water and oil, grease, grime, and paint rinse off. In one plant, girls who were lacquering gun stocks used to clean their hands with lacquer solvent. The solvent took the oil out of their skins and caused a severe skin irritation. On the advice of their plant safety director, the girls now use Protec. Skin ailments are one of the most important occupational diseases because skin infection can slow up production just as easily as a lost time accident. If you have this problem and want to help men and women workers avoid skin irritation... Write to DuPont Radio Section, Wilmington, Delaware, for additional information. Protec will not solve every such problem, and it should not be used if you're dealing with a chemical which can be absorbed through the skin. But it may help, because it is one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. And now, the star of tonight's cavalcade, Edward Arnold. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, uh, other players on Cavalcade and I have attempted to reenact for you a true and great story in the finest tradition of our Navy. The man who inspired others to fulfill that tradition is Captain John S. Phillips of the U.S. Navy. 
Miss Isabel Layton, co-author of Fat Girl, will now present him to you from New York City. When Charles Rawlings and I were assigned to the story of the USS Neo show, we felt it was privilege enough just to be allowed to write it. In the writing, we grew to know Captain Phillips and felt additionally rewarded. But to be able to introduce him to you tonight, on behalf of Chuck Rawlings, who's in the South Pacific, and myself, is a happier experience than any writer can hope for. I wish you could know Captain Phillips as we do, though a lifetime of knowing him wouldn't induce him to talk about how he came to win his Navy Cross. If I know him at all, of one thing I'm sure, he's here tonight only for love of his men and his desire to acknowledge his debt to them. Captain John S. Phillips. Tonight, I have again relived the death struggle of the USS Neosho in the Coral Sea. May I take this opportunity to pay tribute to my heroic men who so gallantly defended their ship in the battle for her life. To those of them at sea or on land who may be listening in tonight, I send my warmest greeting. To the families of those who are no longer here, who paid with everything they had so the Neosho might live, I want to say their sacrifice was not made in vain. And they are tonight remembered and sorely missed. This courageous group of patriots who went forth to do their part in restoring to the world at large those inalienable rights of freedom for which this country stands. From these men, from all men who are out there facing death that we might live, there is a threefold message to you. First, Work as you have never worked before to make our country strong in unity. That unity which alone can bring us speedy victory and preclude the unnecessary loss of life. Second, have faith in all of those men. Faith in your associates. Faith in your government and faith in your God. And third, see to it that when victory has been won... We use it to build a world in which the future generations will not again be called upon to pay in blood for the freedoms that are ours and which we enjoy. Thank you, Captain Phillips. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard Captain John S. Phillips of the USS Neosho, who spoke to you from New York. They dreamed of a day when they could again enjoy the little everyday things of life. Fresh, clean clothes, lipstick, ice cream sodas, bobby pins. They dreamed of these as they waited for the ship that was to take them from the Inferno of Batan. Next week, with Geraldine Fitzgerald as our star, Cavalcade presents Nurses Under Sealed Orders, a new radio play about the gallant young women who tended the wounded on Batan. Be with us next week when Cavalcade presents the popular stage and screen player, Geraldine Fitzgerald, in Nurses Under Sealed Orders. The musical score on tonight's program was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is James Bannon sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Dick comes home on furlough tonight. His room looks a sight. Well, it's too late now to have it repapered. Mother, my boyfriend says DuPont has a wonderful new paint called Speed Easy that covers old wallpaper in one coat. It dries in an hour. Yeah, Speed Easy. Yes, I remember. That's the paint you thin with water. Well, our sailor will have a fresh, clean room to sleep in tonight. This program came to you from New York and Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.